Hi, everyone from Boston. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you for Professor Eric Klapper's webinar on designing games that resonate with learners and learning. Uh, and I'm Chida Mugligan. I'm working as a researcher with Dr. Klapper and his amazing team at MIT Education Arcade. And first, I want to thank our guest, Dr. Klaffer, who is going to share his experiences with us. And uh, today, me and Professor Tusha Chautai will be moderators. And uh, during the talk, uh, you can post your questions on YouTube live chat. In the end of the talk, we will ask these questions to Dr. Klaffer. Uh, let me give a brief information about Professor Ed Klaffer. He is director of Shalar Teacher Education Program and the uh, Education Arcade at MIT. His team focuses on development and use of computer games and simulations for building in-depth learning. He created the iconic Star Logo platform that allows students and teachers to program their own simulations uh, of complex systems. His team also developed many well-known platforms and games to support playful learning experiences. And thank you for being with us. And I'm giving the floor to Dr. Chaltai. Uh, thank you, Chidem. Uh, welcome, everybody. So uh, we are glad to meet, uh, be with uh, Eric and in this uh, great uh, presentation. So uh, this presentation is actually organized uh, in cooperation with uh, Middle East Technical University uh, Science Communication Group. We also uh, thank the, uh, our president of office uh, providing uh, the facilities and also uh, Turkish interpreter and so I uh, you know I mean this uh, digital games uh, especially uh, use of digital games in education is a hot topic and there are a lot of benefits uh, reported in several uh, journals several uh, research studies and Eric and his team is doing uh, a lot of uh, great work uh, so it's a great pleasure for us uh, being with uh, Eric. Uh, before the session, uh, I asked him uh, whether he has been to Turkey before, but it looked like it looks like this is his first time in in Turkey. Uh, so, uh, so maybe this is the, the uh, one of the good uh, aspects of Corona pandemic. Uh, we had a chance to invite those great researchers to such uh, events. And uh, we hope in the future, uh, we would like to see uh, Eric uh, physically in, in Turkey. And uh, we would like to uh, listen him uh, in one of our uh, Middle East Technical University uh, auditoriums. Okay, so I don't want to, uh, talk uh, more and I, I know I mean everybody is waiting for his uh, Eric's uh, presentation as Chidam said uh, you can ask your questions uh, through uh, the message uh, through the chat window uh, at the end of the session uh, I hope we will have about 10 15 minutes uh, for question and answer uh, session again thank you Eric okay. thank you and thank you for, for having me here and there I guess um, <laughs> It's wonderful to, to be able to uh, be in Turkey um, and also be here at MIT. This is virtual MIT. Um, one of the projects that the students have taken on here um, while they've been at home um, during the pandemic is to recreate MIT in Minecraft. Um, and this is Minecraft MIT behind me here. Uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, uh, my program and myself. Um, so uh, as, as introduced, uh, I run the Scheller Teacher Education Program. That's STEP and T, which is the Education Arcade. Um, and through both of these groups, we think a lot about um, playful and meaningful learning. That's the, the way we want to create our environments and the way we want to teach our own students to teach um, in classrooms. Um, and so the way we do that is through um, enabling playful and meaningful learning experiences using the affordances of new technologies. So we think a lot about um, what new technologies have to offer us um, and also where the sort of the big needs are um, in teaching and learning experiences and where we can connect those two things to make for powerful learning. Um, we design and create experiences and I'll talk a lot about that work today that we've done through creating new kinds of technologies. 
Um, we also implement and scale experiences. So we think about uh, making an impact with our work. Um, as an academic unit, we think about that impact through um, research and through publications, but we also think about that that impact through people who are using our products and who are um, able to use this in their own classrooms and their own lives. Um, and finally, we develop capacity for more experiences. So one of the things we do in our group um, is to work with other groups who want to create educational games, use educational technology, and we think about ways we train them to in turn um, make those technologies themselves. In those cases, one of the things we look for is how do we ultimately make ourselves obsolete? How do we how do we train enough other people to do this work where we don't necessarily need to be doing the work for them, um, but they're doing this work on their own? And we've done that a number of places around the world over the years. Um, those those last three, but particularly the you know we think about the first two of those: um, designing and creating experiences and implementing and scaling experiences. And those are sort of the fundamental backbones of design-based research which is the research that we primarily do, not exclusively, but primarily do in our lab. Um, for those of you that don't know design-based research, um, it starts with an analysis of practical problems. Um, so the, the word I like to emphasize there is practical. Um, so it's about thinking about real problems that people are facing in teaching and learning. We develop potential solutions, um, oftentimes in partnership with the practitioners who are facing those problems. Um, we iteratively test and redesign in practice. So it's a lot about quickly getting things into testing and then testing and, and redesigning. So we learn from each test, we redesign and we, we test again. And finally, and I think this is a very important step in what makes this research, um, is we reflect to distill design principles. So we think about what happened, what did we learn through this process? And not only how people can replicate the specific work that we've done, but how to replicate the principles that we've distilled from our own work. So if we've learned about, for example, one of the games I'll talk about how uh, massively multiplayer games can work effectively in education, other people can design things in a similar way. And you'll see the arrows here um, showing that we this is not necessarily a linear process. We don't always start um, and then move through all these processes um, in a line, but rather we sort of jump back and forth to them as we sort of see fit along the way. Um, the kind of work we do, uh, I think, focuses on um, uh, what, what sometimes are called 21st century skills, and, and I'm often reminded that um, you know this this graph here is from 2007, when we were sort of early on in the 21st century. We're now 20% done with the 21st century, and we're still not really hitting these things very well in schools. Um, when you think about things like critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity. These are the things that inevitably we hear about are needed for the 21st century. Businesses need these things. You know, modern society needs these things. Um, our social lives need these things. Um, and, and we're not teaching them effectively in schools. Um, but you think about those same things, um, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, and, and kids are learning them in some places. Um, and we see them uh, being fairly pervasive inside of games. Um, they're doing, critical thinking as they have to solve different puzzles and games. They have to communicate when they play multiplayer games and need to coordinate um, effectively their strategies and what they're doing to other people. And it's really clear, and this is the game Fortnite here in the upper right, um, it's really clear when you see players and teams that are doing this effectively and when they're, when they're not. Um, collaboration is important, it, it's related to communication. So you're communicating in order to collaborate. Um, so how do you work effectively? How do you divide up jobs and roles? Um, and finally, creativity. Um, you know, we have games like Roblox here in the lower right where kids are creating new things and sharing those things as part of what they're doing. And sometimes that's in-game, um, like in Roblox here, where they're um, sharing actually things that they make. But oftentimes that creativity comes from um, you know, the way that they might uh, film a video of their own work and share that work or design something as, as fan art um, for, that's based on, uh, on a game. I think some of, the, some of the seminal work that was in this space was Jim G's book, um, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. Um, it's a book that I still use, even though it's uh, now, um, I think, nearing 20 years old, but it's still a book that's important in, in the courses that I teach on this, on this topic, really lays out some of the fundamental things that we think about when learning from games. And the interesting thing about this was that it was not a book that was about educational games, 
but it was a book about what do people learn just by playing games, good games. Um, and uh, it's about things like uh, your identity. How do you think about yourself in that space? Um, situated meaning. So as I try to understand something, it's not just something that I think of out of context, but it has a meaning in a particular space, a particular context that I'm thinking in. Transfer of knowledge. One of the um, uh, hardest problems that we think about in learning science is about how you learn something in one context and transfer it to another context. Um, it has to happen all the time in games. So you learn to solve a puzzle in one context, and then you take that same principle and apply it in another context. So um, as we think about good games, um, they're applying a lot of, I think, really important and meaningful um, learning sciences to, to the way that they do it, even if they're doing it inadvertently. Um, there's good research um, as well on, on as we think about games and 21st century skills. Um, this was a study that came out a few years ago um, and uh, was a meta study looking across other studies of, of games um, and found that 85% of the measured outcomes had significant impact on 21st century skills. So it's a, a good correlation between the kind of stuff we see going on in games um, and the kinds of things people should be learning in these new contexts. Um, other, other research studies look at things like um, uh, attention focusing, efficiency of processing, creativity, um, social, emotional learning, um, all these kinds of things that we're really thinking about more importantly in schools than we used to. Um, as we think about them um, through these studies, uh, we're seeing that, that games are being effective in promoting them. And I, I, again, I'll say, I, I use the word good games here um, because it's not that I think every game is good at doing these things, but if you look across games, there's a lot of them that are exhibiting the, the fundamental design principles that enable these and embody these principles. What are some of those things um, that make things good games uh, and good games for education? Um, so this, the sort of upward lines here are showing the things that sort of have more of an impact. So things like multiplayer games have a, a greater impact. Pro-social content has a greater impact. Um, you think about the surrounding instruction um, that's in there. Um, so it's important to think about games not as um, the sole uh, part of a game experience for learning, but rather uh, one activating function of that game. And I'll talk about that later. Immersive long form games, uh, and integrated learning environments, so things that integrate directly with learning. Um, so what does creative thinking look like? Um, so in many ways, it looks like this. This is uh, Minecraft on a phone. Uh, I think Minecraft is actually a game that is one of the few that's crossed that boundary between um, educational game and um, entertainment game. Uh, it was designed to be an entertainment game, but it's one of the most popular games um, in schools at this point. Um, we think about things like uh, creative thinking in Fortnite, um, if you've watched uh, you know, excellent players play in these spaces. Um, sometimes I, I wonder, like, why do people like to see other people play video games? And you won't wonder that when you see people who are really good at it. You're like, it's like watching um, a great athlete in any kind of sport. You can really marvel at the the expertise that they have in doing things um, as they solve problems um, and work together and um, and really do so in an excellent way. That's 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 obvious of the deep thinking that's going on there. Um, so creative play can look like uh, like this. This is um, these are uh, some some great video games. Some of them are educational. Some of them are not educational. Um, but it can take many different forms, from casual games that you play on a phone or an iPad um, to deep immersive games that you might play, um, you know, in long form on a computer. They can also take this form as well. Um, we've seen a resurgence in uh, in in tabletop games in the last several years. I think through platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and, and self-publishing platforms that people have for, for uh, tabletop games. Tabletop games have really created a, an interesting space that people can think through um, and innovate in as well. Um, and we're seeing that uh, being translated to schools as well, as we see games that are not only digital making their ways into school, but, but tabletop games as well. And in many ways, teachers are more apt to be able to integrate these into their classrooms. They're not afraid of the sort of the the digital barriers that they might face if something goes wrong when they think about some integrating some of these games. And I think in many ways, it's an important gateway to being able to use um, digital games as well. So really important space to think about. So well, I've been talking about games um, so far. And when people think about games, um, they often think about uh, games that look like this, games that are 3D first person shooters. Um, they think about uh, you know, boys playing these games together on consoles and dark rooms uh, and eating unhealthy food as they do so. Um, and, um, and that's somewhat true. Um, 
uh, and they think about learning games and they say, well, let's let's just put some learning content. We know what people like. Let's put learning content into the game and, and this will be a great learning game. <clears throat> and that's uh, oftentimes how people think about learning games is this, is this sort of like mixture of what they think of as a video game with something that's immediately recognizable as educational content. But this is not what we mean by, by educational games at all. Uh, and certainly I think even in terms of games, I think uh, what we've seen, I mentioned the sort of the broadening of people's perspectives on, on tabletop games over the last several years, but we've also seen this in video games. Um, a lot of the statistics we see now about who plays video games, it's really just about everybody. Uh, I often go to a teacher conference and I'll, I'll ask, I'll say, how many of you play video games? And you know, I'll get 10 or 20% of the people to raise their hands. And I say, well, how many of you play you know, casual games on your phone? And then lots of hands go up. And I, sorry, how about on your iPad? You know, do, you, do some of you play Words with Friends or other kinds of social games? And then more hands go up. And the thing is, people don't think about the kinds of games that they're playing as video games, but there's no, there's no specific ownership that first person shooters have over the, the title video game. Video games are this sort of broad set of games that lots of people are playing. Um, I think this kind of perspective of, of the video game as the reward system comes from um, the legacy of Math Blaster. It's one of the most, it's probably the most successful educational game of all, all time. Um, and it was designed on a principle where the, 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 en the entertainment, the, the fun comes from as a reward for learning. So in, uh, in Math Blaster, you have these math problems and they're floating in the sky. Uh, and um, what happens is you have, need to match the math problem that's at the top of the screen with what's floating here on the uh, uh, below it. Um, and the idea is that if you get it right, something explodes and goes off your screen. And in this case here, it happens to be about math problems, but this could be you know history facts, it could be spelling, you know anything could be sort of matching of these two things here. Um, this idea is something that we've referred to, uh, and and I did not coin this term, but uh, I wish I had. Um, as chocolate covered broccoli. So the idea here is that the broccoli is something that you want kids to eat. Um, it's something that's good for them. Um, and chocolate is something we know that they like. So that's something that they that they that they want to eat. Um, and if we put those things together, that will make something that kids will will enjoy and and will benefit from. Um, but we think about that, um, and maybe it gets kids to eat the broccoli a little bit at first. Um, but it doesn't promote healthy eating or healthy learning. Um, and we all know what happens when the when the chocolate goes away, they'll stop eating the broccoli. Um, and in fact, my colleague Scott uh, often will say that what this is doing is actually teaching kids um, that the topic isn't fun. And the only way that you should do this topic is if we give you a reward for that. So if we give you chocolate every time you do a math problem, we're saying math isn't any fun. Um, and really, you should only do math if you if you get a reward for doing it. Um, and the opposite of that is this is, a, this is actually a, a game that Scott created um, called The Logical Journey of the Zumbinis, um, one of the, I think, great um, educational games of all time. Um, instead, we think about learning as something that should be playful. So this really weird picture here is, is Coco and Broccoli. And we're thinking about a way we much more deeply integrate those things. So they're not two distinct um, entities, but really something that's much more deeply integrated. Um, so in the logical journey of the Zumbinis, which is a math game, you will never see a math problem on the screen. Uh, it's a game where math is embedded within the world and you're using math to solve problems within the world. You can't substitute another topic here. This can't be a game about chemistry. This is a game about math because the, the, the problems that you're solving are math problems. Um, and it really, it's not, it's not making math fun, but showing that math is fun. So math is fun because it helps you solve these problems that are, you, you care about solving. Um, and that's a much different perspective on, on game design. I think it's a really important um, thing to think about as we design educational games. Um, so I think also this, this um, notion of what educational games are um, is somewhat um, uh, influenced by this idea that this is what gaming should look like. So gaming should be fun. Gaming should be, you know, ecstatic, fun, throwing your hands in the air. This is what it should look like when you're when you're playing video games. Um, but instead, we this is we we see people actually playing video games. So the the pictures on the left here are uh, from a photo essay that somebody did on the faces of gamers. Um, so they're actually playing video games. The 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 light that you see is coming from the screen that they're watching. 
Uh, and um, that's actually one of my own kids playing a, a video game at a, one of our big video game conferences that we have here in Boston, which has you know, tens of thousands of people at it. Um, and you'll see this sort of intense focus that they have on their faces um, as they're playing the game, as they're looking at the screen, um, as they're thinking about what they're doing here. Um, and really, as we think about this, the, 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 the fun of gaming is not sort of like the, the bells and whistles and things that you see on the screen, but it's really about um, this idea of hard fun. And hard fun is a term coined by uh, my, my predecessor, Seymour Papert at MIT, and he found that people were having, he was doing studying um, kids doing logo programming. So early, early days of computer programming with kids back in the 1970s and 80s. And he found that kids were having fun not in spite of what they were doing being hard, but because it was hard. So the idea is that they would be given a hard problem, a challenging problem, and the, the fun, the joy would come from overcoming that challenge. So um, yeah, they'd be given a, a programming challenge to design something, and they'd struggle with that from time to time. And eventually, they'd come up with some solution that they were happy with. And that was where the joy came from, from overcoming that. We see that in video games. Um, it's, if you have a video game that's too hard um, and, you, and you can't overcome the challenges, then, then you often will walk away. But if, also, if it's too easy, you'll also walk away. If there's no challenge there at all, there's no sense of satisfaction. Regardless of how the game tells you you're doing wonderful and all those sorts of things, if you don't feel like there's some chance that you're not going to succeed, then you often walk away because the game isn't challenging you. And that's really, I think, the critical piece that we think about when we think about design of good games is designing things, something that's hard fun, something that's, that's just hard enough to sort of make it challenging, but not so hard that you drop out. And in fact, that's actually what um, Vygotsky, a famous uh, learning theorist, uh, thought about in his zone of proximal development um, is that you have this sort of set of things in this middle here. There's a set of things that you can do or will do. Um, so those are things that you can do on your own. Um, and then out here in this red zone here, you have a set of things that you can't do or won't do. So that those are things you, you can't do at all. And in the middle here in the yellow zone here, we have things that you can do or will do with help. Um, and that's the zone of proximal development. The idea is if you stay in that yellow zone there, the things that you can do with a little bit of support, um, that's where the best learning happens. Um, and as we think about good learning environments, we think about that's where we want to keep kids. We want to keep kids in a space where they're continually challenged, but sort of making progress along the way. Um, and that's also what we do in video games. You keep people continually challenged, but where they make progress along the way. Um, if you play a video game and you get and you start to get good at it, and then you sort of go back to level one and you're like, oh man, like I struggled with that. And now I'm so, I've learned all these great skills and now I'm so much better at this because I sort of went through a series of, um, of, of uh, challenges along the way that led me to this place where I've gotten better. Um, and it's really about that idea of scaffolding um, that we think is, is, you know, is a common um, design term that we use in, in designing educational environments um, where you sort of help people along the way with some supports that, that get them better at solving problems. And then eventually you sort of remove those things along the way. Um, and you see good games do that same thing. In a tutorial level, it gives you lots of support. In level one and two, you're getting a, continuing to get that support. By level 10, a lot of those supports have gone away and you've been introduced to new challenges. Um, part of this is also that we think about um, uh, you know, learning, particularly through games, as something that's structured. Um, so in some ways, uh, uh, you know, designing a good game is about designing a good sense of structure along the way. So um, uh, we, we play these sort of structured, goal-oriented, feedback-driven situations because they, because they can be fun. So in games, we willingly submit to some arbitrary set of rules um, in pursuit of mastery, but only if we continue to be playful along the way. So you think about a game like golf, um, and in golf, um, you know, there's a set of rules around that, about what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and we know that like you have a long stick and there's a little ball and you need to be able to hit that ball to a little hole that's far away. There's all these sort of sets of rules about what you can do and what you can't do. And you people sort of regularly submit to this because they think it's fun. Um, even though we know it'd be actually much easier to pick up the ball and just put it in the hole. Um, but we don't do that because that's too easy. There's no challenge there. Um, the sort of the set of rules and goals around it that have been structured here make it more fun, make it more challenging, make it more interesting to sort of do it with this long stick that you have to hit into the hole that's really far away. Um, and that's what we think about as designing good games. It's about sort of making that challenge something that's worth pursuing in and of itself, that it's not about the rewards that I'm getting, but rather the, the, the challenge that makes it the, 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 the rewarding um, part of the structure. 
I compare that to, to what many people think of as gamification, um, which is not the same thing as games. Um, and my definition of this is applying the game mechanics uh, to an unrelated set of tasks. Um, so we often see this as a reward system, a set of badges, a set of rewards. Um, and you know, oftentimes there are sort of very low barriers to entry in terms of what you're getting here. So um, you get rewards for doing relatively trivial things. That isn't to say that I think that badges themselves are, are worthless. In fact, I think that in the right context, these kinds of rewards can be very meaningful, um, particularly when we think about them as something that is a significant accomplishment um, by, by doing something that, re that required a lot of commitment. I've developed a, a, some sort of um, notation that I've, I've succeeded, and I might be able to convey that information to other people in my community. So maybe I'm, a, you know, if I imagine myself as, a, we've seen this kind of stuff in um, technical communities for kids. So as they're learning to program or learning to design web pages, you know, maybe you learn HTML, maybe you learn CSS, uh, you get a level one or a level two sort of badge there and you share that with your community. So someone is a level two and someone wants, is a level one and needs some help, they might go to a level two person in that area. So I think badges can be helpful, but not when they're sort of this um, very short term sort of trivial reward system. In fact, I think that in many cases here, like the chocolate covered broccoli, they're in fact, um, becoming a crutch, that, that that they're something that you rely on to sort of keep making progress. And when they stop going, when they stop giving you rewards, you stop um, progressing. So instead, I think about these five things as being critical to, to making games good. Um, and uh, and they all have to do with the structure of games. And I think what you won't see here is that, you know, there's, there's they're fun or engaging. And I, I like to use the word engaging. And I think that's also a, obviously a, an important part of games. Um, but I think that's sort of the uh, the part that people focus on immediately. And I think these are the ones that we, people really should be thinking about. Um, so the first one of those is interesting decisions. Um, and that's what Sid Meier, uh, who famously created uh, the game Civilization, thinks about as the hallmark for um, for good games. So the idea is that they're not just decisions, but they're interesting. And they're interesting because I have some information that might help me think about what I want to do. Um, so it's not just flipping a coin and thinking about whether it's going to be heads or tails, but rather I'm thinking about um, some interesting thing that I have information on. Consequences to those decisions. So I can be rewarded or punished for, um, for choosing different things. And I know that I might have those consequences. Um, clearly defined goals, um, which can be a set of rules or constraints. I make sure that the word goals is plural um, because I think a lot of good games allow people to choose amongst many goals. Thinking back to the game Civilization, um, there's actually many different ways to win the game Civilization. Um, civilization is a game where you're building a civilization on a map. Um, and you can win by taking the most territory. You can win by brokering world peace. You can win by um, sending a rocket to Mars. There's many different ways you can win. And each individual may choose to pursue one or more of those and change over time as well. So I think that, that sense of having multiple different goals allows people to sort of enter the same space um, and play differently. I think going back to the, my reference to Minecraft earlier, it's I think one of the things that has made Minecraft so successful is that there's so many different ways to think about what my goals are in that space. So I might be able to build some particular structure. I might be able to explore some unknown land. I might be able to find some really rare element. There's so many different goals in there and the game really doesn't specify them to me. I have to think about my own sort of definite defi defining of those goals. And I think that's really what makes the game so great. Visible measurable feedback. So sometimes people think about that as score. So some metric as to how well I'm doing. Um, and I think it's important to have quantifiable outcomes, um, but I actually think just like the goals, I think this should also be different kinds of feedback. So I might have measures of uh, my points, I might have measures of my health, I might have measures of my social network I've developed in the game, I might have gear I've collected. There's so many different ways to think about measuring my um, my my success and my, my progress in the game, and good games provide many different metrics to that. Finally, there's some sort of underlying model or system. Um, so again, a board game that could be a good coherent set of rules. In a lot of the work that we do in educational games, we think about it as some actual um, scientific system that we're trying to model. It could be about genetics or um, mechanics or whatever it is, um, but it's some sort of model that governs how the, how the system works. And rather than sort of saying something is a game or is not a game, I think about things that are different levels of gaminess. 
it's not, I don't know if that word translates very well. It doesn't work very well in English for that matter, so it's okay. <laughs> um, but the idea is that you have some things that have a lot of these qualities and some things that don't have very much of these qualities. Um, so some games like World of Warcraft or good board games have a lot of those qualities. Um, and it's not that you couldn't make um, sort of games out of uh, things like movies or dolls or books, but they don't sort of have the innate qualities that sort of lend themselves to being made into games. Um, so uh, what we've done in my lab over the last several years, um, we do a lot of um, projects, uh, some of them big, some of them small, um, some of them that are things we've done on our own, some of them we do with other partners. Um, and uh, about a year or so ago, we came out with a book called Resonant Games, um, and it was a collection of these uh, case studies that we've done, trying to distill some of the design principles that we've had along the way to think about what's important for designing um, educational games. We called it Resonant Games. Um, again, this is I have this up here because it doesn't always translate well, but resonance is this idea you know, of one tuning fork and it vibrates, um, and you can put another tuning fork there, and if you put them in proximity, they will vibrate with each other. Um, the idea is that there's ability to evoke or suggest enduring images, memories, or emotions. So the idea is it's evocative. And that's what we try to have in our games. It's games that connect with students, it connects with their minds, it connects with the studies that they have, um, it connects with their everyday lives. Um, and that's what we try to do. We try to have these games that are much synchronized with their with with the with the audiences who are trying to engage. Um, so there's four big, we have a, a you know 25 or so uh, sort of small scale principles, but we have four big design principles that we think about. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll sort of go into them. I'll, I'll give you a high level overview here and then I'll dive into each one of these four. Um, so the first one is designing for the whole learner. Um, we think about this person not just as a person who's in my class for 45 minutes, four times a week, but something who has a life outside of a school, who has hobbies, who has interests, um, who uh, has friends. Um, and we think about that person as a whole being. Uh, we design for communities. Um, so uh, we think about the, the, the games sort of being uh, social and being connected with um, both the players themselves and the community in which they're embedded. So their, their school, their, their neighborhood, um, all those things are important. Um, designing for knowledge, skills, and practices. So oftentimes we think about educational games as, as enforcing knowledge. That's like some of the games I talked about with math, where it's important to um, you know, remember particular math facts. But the skills and practices, those are the 21st century skills that, that I was talking about earlier. Those are even more important, and I think even better aligned with what games do well. Um, and finally, um, it's designing for society. So we think about these games being in, as part of the world. Um, they're, they're, they're connecting to, um, to, to current issues, to current problems, um, to current things that the students are thinking about um, outside of school, outside of, um, outside of the, the sort of particular disciplinary context we're designing for. So I'll start with designing for communities. Um, uh, the idea is we're designing games that sort of are take into the account the sociality of learning. Um, and we think about that in lots of different ways. Um, and, uh, and we have a few different examples of this. Um, so this is uh, some of our participatory simulations. And the ironic thing about this game is uh, it was one of our most popular mobile games for quite some time. It's a game about uh, a disease going around a community. It's a game we've been doing for many, many years now in various forms. Um, and kids have always struggled with ideas like immunity and um, uh, you know probability of transmission and all these kinds of things. And we try to teach them about some of those ideas through this game. Um, I'm interested in playing this game now when these ideas are sort of fresh in everybody's mind and have a different understanding and see um, and, you know, how the sort of thinking for analyzing this kind of problem has changed. Um, we, we model a lot on sort of casual social games. Um, we've done some work um, in that space. Um, our ubiquitous games, uh, which are games designed for the mobile web or web apps. Um, uh, in this case here, the idea is that you're playing games not in class, um, but you're playing games in sort of short spaces um, between classes um, throughout the day. And when you maybe see your friend in the hallway or when you have five minutes on the bus on the way to school, um, you can play these games and then connect with the data back to what's going on inside the school. Um, we developed a series of these games a number of years ago. Um, in the life sciences and um, and connected them to stuff that was going on inside of the schools and used the data to inform practices that teachers were thinking about. Um, this is another one that we did um, that was about uh, like a Pokemon style card battle game uh, about weather. Um, 
you know, each of these games, we're thinking about the society here, the, the sorry, the community here. Um, it's about sort of uh, multiplayer interactions, um, but that community can also just be about sort of sharing ideas within the community. So um, uh, as you see kids often talking about games, they often will share a screen or share some other sort of artifact that comes from the game. And that's also an important part of, of the, the sociality of gameplay as well. Um, thinking about the whole learner, um, this is a game um, uh, that we're actually designing a new version of right now. Um, this was a game that was an alternate reality game. So this is a game that pretends not to be a game. Uh, it was a game that we developed here in the US with um, the Smithsonian Institute, which is um, our big uh, national science museum in Washington, DC. And they also have networks of other museums around the country that belong to as partners. Uh, and the idea in an alternate reality game is it's a game that pretends not to be a game. So the idea here is that the game started with um, a video. Actually, the game started originally with saying, MIT is going to be launching a science game um, on this particular date. If you're interested in playing, um, come check out the game. Here's our website. Um, and when the game was supposed to launch, instead of launching, we put up this video that said, we're really sorry. We don't know what happened. Our website was hacked. Um, if you know anything about what happened, um, we set up a forum and please post something in the forum. And um, what, what people had to notice was that at the top of the screen for just a fraction of a second, um, there was a little code that would appear. Um, and kids would start to notice there was a code at the top of the screen and they noted, okay, did anybody see the code? It was A, B, C, D, E. And other students would say, no, I, I saw a different code. My code was different than that. Um, and they realized that there were many different codes out there. There were about 100 different codes, but each kid only got one. Um, and they needed to work as a community to put those together because it turned out that they were a sequence, and that sequence was a cryptogram that they needed to decode. So they worked as an entire community. It was thousands of players to decode this message that turned out it was from this future beings who had discovered an Earth-like planet that has, uh, was devoid of life. And they wanted to use Earth as a reference planet to figure out what was going on on this other planet. And so they need to figure out things like, how do we communicate things about temperature when they don't know about our Fahrenheit and Celsius system? How do we communicate things about distance measures when they don't know about meters or yards? Um, so they had to come up with all these different kinds of mechanisms for communicating with these future beings. Um, the interesting thing here was that there were many different ways to participate. So you could be an active in the forums. You could, there were online games. Um, there was measurements you could take in your backyard and contribute. So each kid could think about some way or ways that they wanted to contribute to the game. Um, and all those were equally valid. There wasn't anything that was uh, you know, more or less important than others. They were all important. Uh, and that's a way to sort of think about the whole learner, the, all the different ways they can contribute and some choice um, in making those contributions along the way. We're now making a version of this um, a similar kind of game where it's meant to be sort of launched. This was a, a, a nationwide group of about, I think about 5,000 or 6,000 people that played. Um, we're now making it sort of so that a, a school or a library can sort of run this with you know, the hundreds of kids in their community um, in parallel. Um, resident design for knowledge, skills, and practices. Um, the example I'll give here is actually not one that's in the book, but, um, uh, but one that we call Clever. Um, and Cheatham is actually working on this one, among other projects. Uh, uh, the collaborative learning environments uh, in VR. So it's a virtual reality environment. Um, in this case, the, our first example is one that's about uh, cellular biology. Uh, and it's about uh, sort of having to, there's a, the scenarios that there's a cell where something isn't behaving properly and you need to go inside the cell um, and, and fix it. Uh, and in its original design here, there's actually two roles. Um, so there's someone who's an explorer who actually sees the environment in, in VR. And there's someone who's a navigator who sort of sees this top-down view of the world um, and gets sort of a zoomed out view that the, that the explorer does not see. Um, and so what it looks like in practice is, is, uh, is this, where you sort of have one person in VR and one person on a tablet, and they have to communicate with each other to sort of think about what's going on here. So there's obviously, there is the knowledge. You have to understand how cells work and the different kinds of organelles that are in it and about um, uh, uh, translation and um, transcription, how DNA works. Um, but along the way, you also need to figure out how to solve a problem. You need to be able to work with your partner to be able to communicate. So there's all these different kinds of things you need to be able to do in addition to understanding um, the basics of, of cellular biology along the way. Um, and so, I mean, this is, 
I think equally as important here, we think about this a lot in the kinds of teaching that we do, but it's equally as important in the kinds of games that we design. And um, it's Bloom's taxonomy where, you know, you have some things like about knowledge that are remember and understand, maybe they're at the bottom, um, but you have things like analyze and evaluate there at the top. Um, and really what we try to do is sort of push our game designs up to the, as, as close as we can to the top there. Um, and certainly through games like Clever, we see that um, students are doing that analyzing and evaluation. Uh, Eric, uh, would you please stop a little bit? I mean, our uh, other channel, uh, Turkish translation channel, has some technical problem. Okay, yep. Uh, so now they are trying to fix it. Uh, I will pause. Just, just, yeah, I will inform you in a minute. Yep. Sorry about this. I mean, this technical problems uh, always happen. Okay, just a second. Okay, maybe uh, while we are waiting, we may ask some some questions. Sure. I mean, we we got some some questions regarding the uh, the age. Uh, are those games uh, appropriate for all ages or not? Uh, uh, would you please make some some comments regarding this one while we are waiting? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think so. Some of these games, you know, individual games. I mentioned the the virus game early on. That game I've done with kids as young as ten, um, and I've done it with adults that were studying public health. Um, so some of the games actually work across really wide ranges of of ages. Uh -huh. um, most of our work tends to focus on um, kids ages roughly. 10 to 16 or 17 is where the most of our work has been. Um, uh, in the book, we talk about one project though that was focusing on financial literacy that was focused on um, students who are in their early 20s, um, late, late teens and early 20s who are sort of just going in, into their early adulthood um, and independence. Um, so we've done games there. Um, I think the, the age that we sort of try to target is an age where um, you know, uh, a number of important things happen. So one is that a lot of kids sort of turn off from um, from science and engineering careers because they think it's boring and not applicable to their lives. And one of the things we try to do through the games is sort of show some of those connections as I'm talking here on this slide about society. Um, uh, it's also a time when a lot of uh, teachers struggle to sort of figure out ways that they can make the um, those, those topics and, and uh, relevant to a diverse audience of kids. Um, so we, th we think about that as well. Um, and yet it's sort of a time when, uh, as we think about our own expertise within the lab, we think about it's a time when, um, you know, content and, and the sort of the, the deep, immersive, um, rich spaces that we think about in terms of that content can still be apparent. Uh, like I think about Clever as a game where we worked with cellular biology experts to really understand the, and make sure that we were able to convey it well, um, which is something that we feel like we have the um, the resources to be able to do within our scientific community at MIT is to, to draw upon that. Um, so we want to make sure that we can bring that as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me check. Is it, I think now it's fixed. So we may continue from uh, okay. every state. Okay. I just have a few more slides and I'll get to more questions. Uh, so the last, the last idea here um, in resident design is about designing for society, as I was just mentioning. Um, so we think about these games as being part of a larger community. Um, and uh, one of the projects that we have that connects well with that is our, um, our augmented reality games, <clears throat> which is um, which are games, I, I, now people have reference points like Pokemon Go. Um, they're games that sort of take place outside in real spaces. Um, in our cases, um, we're really trying to deeply connect with the environment that's around us. Um, and we involve both kids um, playing games. Um, so they're games about science issues in their communities or about health issues in their communities, about development issues in their communities um, that they play, um, but they also make games as well. Um, and that's that's sort of a connection here. This is um, Mitch Resnick's uh, cycle where he thinks about imagine, create, play, share, reflect. Um, and we think about play as maybe actually an interesting place to enter this. So um, I, I think in, for many kids, it's great to sort of think about imagining as the first step, but we also think that play can be an important um, step into this space as well. Um, 
So, uh, so that's one sort of way we think about this, this cycle sort of being a virtuous cycle. And we think about ways that people can create those games. And um, you can think about things like Scratch. Uh, my colleague Mitch Resnick's Scratch environment is, is a great way to be doing that. Um, we think about uh, uh, you know, games that, that kids can play there and program in that environment. Um, but we also think about our platform, Tailblazer, as one that they can do that as well, where they're um, making games that exist um, out in the real world. So they're studying issues in their communities. They're um, thinking about where, the, where they might sort of make a difference in those issues, and they're making games about those things. Um, and that relates, I, I mentioned early on, that the game is not meant to be something that's the, the only part of the experience. It's not like someone doesn't know something, they come and they play a game, and they leave, and they know everything. But rather, um, it's really actually important to think about the game as part of an important experience. So the game is an experience. Um, this is the action reflection cycle, which is often associated with experiential education. The idea you're sort of doing active learning. Uh, and um, there's uh, the challenging action, which is the experience itself. But a lot of the learning comes from the debrief that happens afterwards. So this is not something that happens without teachers. Um, it's about teachers sort of uh, facilitating discussion and abstraction from what kids are doing inside the game. So uh, many times kids will sort of even do well at a game, an educational game, and, and feel like they've learned something, but they can't necessarily apply it to the next situation. And that's where this sort of discussion, the reflection, additional resources that a teacher might bring in, those become really important parts of making the experience durable and meaningful and, um, and, and that getting back to that issue of transfer. I'll close with just sort of one other slide here. Um, this is uh, balanced design. My, my former student, Jen Groff, uh, has this design. It's sort of a, a variant of the evidence-centered design model. Um, it's a little bit simplified. Um, and this is often a, a, an important part that we think about for design of our educational games, where we think about, we want to know what's the evidence um, that somebody's learned inside of there. Um, and that's how we sort of think about our design process. This is actually um, the arrows here, just like our design-based research, are sort of cyclical. So we don't necessarily think about this as something that has a single starting place, but something that's actually much more iterative in our design process. But we do think about the evidence that we want to know that somebody's learned something. And I think particularly now, as we think about data that comes from these kinds of games, we think even more and more about those kinds of things because we can use that data to be able to provide real-time evidence, oftentimes for formative purposes, to help us understand, help the students understand, and help their teachers understand um, what they're learning and what they're not learning. So with that, I, I will just say um, our, our book, uh, you can actually get for free online at resonant.games. Um, the, the, the whole book is there, um, and you're welcome to read it there. And with that, I will say thank you, and I'm happy to take additional questions. OK, thank you very much. Uh... Eric, and through the end of the session, we had some problems with uh, Turkish translation. So we apologize uh, from our uh, Turkish uh, listeners, uh, watchers. Uh, so I think now we are ready for questions. We, we got some questions, both from uh, Turkish side and English side. But uh, let me start first. Then I think Chidam is going to ask the next question. Uh, you know, I mean, nowadays everything is associated with this uh, corona pandemic. So what would be the, the impact of uh, this pandemic situation on, on games, educational games, and, or, and in general, uh, school life? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, uh, it's funny because one, one of the big games that we've did uh, a number of years ago, um, Radix, which is uh, detailed in the book, um, is one that I think would be wonderful for this point in time. It's a social, online, massively multiplayer game, um, but it was in Flash, so we don't we don't run it anymore. Um, uh, but I think I think we're seeing demand for those kinds of games right now. So games that are social, um, games that sort of are immersive, games that sort of engage communities. Sort of they're looking for a lot of these kinds of things, and um, because we're finding that. You know, Zoom meetings are sort of a poor substitute for thinking about ways you can fa facilitate interactions online. Um, but we think about other kinds of things that draw upon the strengths of digital interaction as being better for that. So, um, you know, there's lots of lots of engagement we see um, in online games right now. They're very popular, not for educational purposes specifically, but 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 very popular right now. Um, and I think I think people are starting to see. 
um, the, the strengths for doing those kinds of more deep and immersive kinds of digital learning experiences. Um, you know, I think, I think it's going to require, you know, those kinds of games take a long time to develop. Um, so we can't sort of make those overnight. Um, so I think it's going to require some sort of commitment to being able to sort of provide those for the future. Um, uh, I think in the short term, it's about trying to sort of come up with ways that we can um, make some existing resources, things like Minecraft, things like other kinds of online games, um, uh, you know, work in the short term, but think about ways we invest um, for the next time. You know, we don't, you know, we, I think, I think what we're learning now is that we'll, we'll both see sort of continued disruption in the future. And we need to be prepared for that, but we also are learning that there's a lot of great stuff we've been ignoring that we might be able to think about ways of coming up with new educational models um, that rely on these other kinds of resources um, while still having face-to-face -face interactions that will hopefully return soon. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, we've, that we're learning some things about um, new kinds of designs that can sort of have uh, uh, value added both sort of in, in future disruptions as well as um, future life as normal, which I hope is the, the rule, not the exception. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chidam, do you have a question? Uh, yes, so there is a one question asked, yeah. What is your opinion using virtual reality and AR technologies in games? As you mentioned, uh, Clever is one of your VR games. And what are negative and positive aspects of using these kind of technologies? Yeah, there's a lot of interest in, in mixed reality now, or virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, I think one of the things that's important is, is realizing that just because a technology is there doesn't mean we should use it for everything. And I think uh, a lot of times what we see whenever there's a new technology is it's about, you know, how do we do the things we were doing before in the new technology? So, um, you know, how do we give a, a PowerPoint lecture in virtual reality? <laughs> um, maybe that's not, maybe there's no value added there and maybe there's actually distraction and maybe it's worse. Um, so I think a lot of the work that we're trying to do is think about where are those um, value adds in augmented reality and virtual reality? What is What are other media not being able to deliver? So. The idea behind Clever was um, the sense that uh, a lot of the important things that happen in cellular biology are three-dimensional. Um, there's about things that are like fitting together and moving around. Um, they're also about uh, things that happen across different spatial scales that are often represented in the same way in a, in a textbook. Um, so we thought, is virtual reality, so given the 3D um, nature of it, the fact that we sort of have immersiveness that allows us to sort of perceive scale, um, can that sort of help address some of those ideas? So it was based on this sort of um, connection between the technology and the thing we wanted people to learn. And then we do research to see how, how well that connects. So I think, I think that there's a lot of uh, potential there for virtual reality to connect around some of those things, but it's, it's about sort of figuring out where, what are the things that it can specifically um, provide that you can't do in other ways? Because I do think that there, there's additional overhead of it. Um, you know, right now it's putting on goggles, which means you're sort of filtering out some of the world. Um, it's about the logistics of doing that. It's about the expense of doing that. Um, so we are thinking a lot about where is the, the value added for that. I think augmented reality seems like it's potentially a nice mix um, because it doesn't sort of cut you off from the world. It can sort of embed things within the world. But again, there it's thinking about why, why is it important to, to put a model on a tabletop um, that I could look at on a screen may not have a lot of value added to it. Why not just look at it on a screen? Um, but maybe it's about um, you know looking at that augmented reality thing in the context. Maybe it's about looking at a building in my community and I can see it relative to the other buildings. Um, maybe it's about looking at an animal in a in a context about outside where it matters. Maybe it's about um, doing some collaborative design where I'm designing something in a real space. Um, so we think about the the kinds of things that it's offering that you can't do with other media, and we're thinking about the ways that we can sort of develop a set of principles that help guide us where the where the value is added and where it's not. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And yes, Dr. Chalta. Okay. Uh, I think there is another question. Uh, I think it comes from a teacher, I, I guess. Uh, uh, development environment. I mean, uh, the, the person asked uh, how should they design uh, games and what kind of uh, platforms do you suggest, uh, for, especially for teachers? Yeah, I mean, so so I teach a course on on designing educational games, and at MIT we do have some students who are programmers, but we often have a lot of them who are not programmers, um, and we want to make that design accessible to all. So there's a lot of great platforms out there now 
that don't require um, a lot of programming. There's always some that's required, I think, to sort of make a, a, a new kind of game. Um, but we have people develop um, games in Scratch. Um, uh, we have people who develop games uh, on, um, oh, there's, a, there's a number of sort of platforms that are sort of these block-based like Scratch or App Inventor, where you're sort of dragging blocks of code around instead of typing text. Um, there's a number of those out now. Um, there's Construct2. There's um, Game Maker. Um, so there's a number of platforms that are out there that allow you to make games without having sort of a deep level of coding knowledge. Um, and I think there's, there's, it's great to do those, even if those are you know small things you might do for your own class that you're not going to deploy to the world. Um, it's great to think about how you might use some of those. And there's, there's more and more of those that become more accessible um, every year. OK, thank you. Uh, Chida? Uh, yes, uh, there is a one question. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion uh, about using leaderboards in these resonant games or educational games? Can these kind of, uh, kinds of tools might have negative aspects? Uh, do you recommend using them? Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> one thing I didn't mention much is competition. <laughs> Um, and uh, people do think about competition a lot in games as being a, a primary means of, of constructing um, uh, you know, player to player interactions. And, and we have had some competition in some of our games, but it tends, we tend not to have that in most of our games. Um, you know, I, I think leaderboards can be, can be interesting and helpful. Um, you know, it gives you a sense of where, where you, how you compare to other people. But I think if you're going to do that, it's important to sort of make it um, something that you opt into as opposed to being so it's forced upon you. And I think it's important to have things that are not the leaderboard, but things that are sort of, um, I mentioned all the different sort of feedback mechanisms that you can have, like uh, points and health and wealth and numbers of friends. <laughs> so if you have more sort of measures of those things that show the diversity of players, um, the better it is. So so my, my philosophy has tended to be to allow them to exist, but not put them up front um, and to make as many as possible so that people can sort of see the diversity of, of how they're doing. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, this question, actually, you at at one point uh, you mentioned about this uh, this issue, but uh, maybe we should uh, get another explicit answer. As as I'm reading the, the question as as it is, why people waste time watching others play games? They can easily play <laughs> game themselves. I mean, what do you think, Eric? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that's that until you've done it, it becomes a, a, a sort of a strange thing. Um, but we've been doing this for centuries. Um, you know, we I can play sports. I can play uh, soccer. I can play uh, football. I can play hockey. But uh, but I watch other people do it. <laughs> I watch them because they're good. I watch them because it's interesting. I watch them because I might learn something. I watch them because it might I might be inspired by them. Um, I watch them because it's amazing to watch somebody who's at the top of their game do something that's really interesting um, that I that I can't do yet. Um, so I think I think once people start to realize the parallels between um, the kind of games that we've watched for centuries and millennia. Uh, and uh, the kinds of games that we're watching on screen as not being so different from each other, I think all of a sudden it starts to make sense um, that that we're that we're able to do these things. And and I think even now, um, you know, uh, here and and in many parts of the world, the other kinds of sports aren't being played, and so people are watching like uh, basketball players play video game basketball with each other. <laughs> Um, so, and, or, or car racing and, and other kinds of games like that. So I think people are starting to get a sense of like, oh, there's actually, it's a lot closer to sports than I, than I thought it was. Okay. Thank you. I mean, my, my son also, I mean, uh, he always watched, uh, those, I mean, well-played games. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's something new. Uh, it's uh, something, something different. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, Chidam, do you have any final question? We are almost done. Uh, if you have uh, uh, one final question. Okay. Uh, one question is, I think you answer about which games are your favorite? Which games are my games favorite? Are, you're playing, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
So I, I me- I've mentioned Minecraft a number of times. It's a game I've come back to again and again. I use it in my own class. I think it is one of the better games of all time. Um, I've been playing during the pandemic. I've been playing a lot of uh, puzzle adventure games, which is one of my favorite genres. There's a series of games called Rusty Lake um, that I've been playing with one of my kids. Um, and we've done some escape rooms recently as well um, that, that we enjoy. Um, and I've been, go- I've been playing some World of Warcraft recently as well, which is a, a social massive multiplayer game. I've been playing with some folks in the lab. Um, it's a way to sort of uh, immerse yourself in a world with other people and do things together when we, when we can't be physically together. So it's another one that I've been playing a lot of lately. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Klaufer. And thank you, everyone, for being with us. Um, yeah, uh, I also would like to uh, share my favorite game. I recently, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Half-Life Alex, uh, the recent one, my favorite. Uh, that was great. Uh, OK, so we are done. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. And also, thanks all those uh, attended the, this session. At one point, uh, I, I counted about uh, 500 people uh, were watching this uh, great presentation. And as I said, I mean, in the near, uh, hopefully near future, uh, we would like to uh, see you uh, in, in Turkey uh, physically. And uh, we also would like to share, I mean, Middle East Technical University uh, would also like to sh- uh, collaborate uh, with uh, MIT and with your team in further projects because we are also doing uh, similar uh, projects. And again, thank you very much for your uh, great presentation. Great. I look forward to seeing you in person sometime. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.